Oh, should I start over? Uh, sure. Okay, welcome tonight to our friends who are here in the room and also joining us online. I am Kara Ripley, the Adult Services Librarian, librarian at the Oregon Public Library. And with us tonight, we have Linda Conway. Con Conway. Conroy. Conroy. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Of Moonwise Herbs uh, to talk to us about putting up your herbs. Uh, this is the fourth and final class in the gardening series. The previous classes were recorded and are available on YouTube, and this class will also be recorded. And um, to those who registered, I will send out all the links in a follow-up email. Uh, if you're attending online, you can use the chat feature to ask any questions, or you can email me directly at kripley at oregonlibrary.org, and I'll make sure that those questions get asked. If you're here in the room, of course, you can just raise your hand and ask your question. Um, and that's all we have here before I pass it over to Linda Conroy. <laughs> all right, here you go. Thank you, Kara. Thanks for having me and thanks for hosting. Am I good here? Okay. And welcome to people who are in the room and people who are online. Um, this has been a really fun series. I don't know any, how many people have tracked it, but we started out planning your herb garden. And so we started that, I believe, in February. And so it's so interesting to go from planning to starting to cultivate to um, tending was our last one. And this one is putting up herbs for food and medicine because as we were talking about briefly before we started, things are starting to show up that we can actually harvest and do something with. <laughs> and so um, as Kara said, my name is Linda Conroy. I'm an herbalist. I'm a community herbalist. I do a lot of different things. I teach classes and workshops and I run the Midwest Women's Herbal Conference as well as a fall mushroom conference friends and I garden and I um, grow things and I try to put up a lot of my own food and medicine throughout the year and so we're going to talk about putting up herbs for food and medicine and I often don't distinguish food and medicine because from my perspective the more well we eat <laughs> the healthier we are so uh, so then we need less medicine hopefully <laughs> but I do put up medicine as well so I'm going to go through this as Kara said um, people who are in the room ask questions as we go along and if you're online um, feel free to put them in the chat and I'm happy to stop at any point and answer questions so um, let's go ahead and start here so uh, just thinking about putting up herbs so putting our, up herbs is a time-honored practice one of the things I've noticed, though, is a lot of people aren't sure. They'll grow herbs and they'll say to me, well, what do I do with these? I have all these herbs because herbs are actually really resilient in the garden and they tend to do well. <laughs> they don't take as much tending, especially things like mint, right? How many people have had mint just like take over their garden? And then you go, what do I do with all of that mint? You know, <laughs> I can only drink so much tea. <laughs> so, so there are other things we can do with it. It's well um, we can um, store herbs for out when we are utilizing them for when they're out of season which is nice and then we um, ha can have a full cover cupboard of medicine and um, food and spices I just um, had one of my students and I chopped up a bunch of oregano and chives and thyme and we minced it really fine and I put it on my drying rack and so I'm gonna have this really nice Italian seasoning blend that came right from my garden <laughs> so um, so that you know there's all these things we can do where we might buy some things um, typically we can actually prepare them ourselves and we and like I said we mince that up really really fine so it's, I'm gonna have it in a jar by the stove and I'll just be able to put it in just like I would any other spice so having that available is just really satisfying. Um, it's going to add really good flavor and nourishment. And one of the things I'll talk about is that a lot of herbs ha are pretty nutrient dense. They offer us a lot of nutrition. So not only do we put them in our food for um, flavor, but they're going to give us some n 
nourishment and nutrition as well. So we'll talk about that. And there's so many different ways as I was going through this, I'm like, well, what things do I focus on? Because there's so many different ways to um, put up your herbs and store them. Um, and thinking about that, even planning for how will I use them? I've been doing this for about 30 years. So I have a lot of ideas about what I will and won't use. When I first started doing this, I put up a lot of things that I wasn't gonna, that I ended up not utilizing. And that's sort of a drag, right? So I've gotten um, aware of what I actually will use and what I won't use throughout the year. So that's, that's nice to get in touch with. So one of the first things is drying herbs. Drying herbs is really easy. Um, there's just some elements that you want to think about when you're drying them. And um, this is a photo of my current drying rack. This is exactly what it looks like <laughs> right now. Um, we, I tried to put some current pictures in here so you can see what I'm actually doing. So this is actually a picture of oat straw. And oats are exactly what you think they are. That's what you make oatmeal out of. <laughs> and I grow these to make a really strong infusion. I drink something called a nourishing herbal infusion every single day of an herb. And I rotate them with different herbs. And this is one of the ones I drink daily. And I drink it for a couple of reasons. One, it's really high in calcium. And it's also really nourishing and strengthening to the nervous system. And so drinking this, and it tastes good. <laughs> and it's actually, it also helps with focus. And so I think a lot of us have trouble focusing these days because who knows what to focus on, right? Because this, the world's so chaotic. So oat straw is really nice if you drink it regularly. It kind of keeps you more calm and focused. So it's really easy to grow. It's a grass, so we just grow it. And then um, the past week, my students and I have harvested it. And so we put it on the drying racks. We let it dry. and. One of the things people always say to me, how do you know something is dry enough? And how you know is it should snap. It should be really crisp. <laughs> and so I have a drying area where I have a ceiling fan. So you, one of the elements is to make sure there's lots of airflow through your herbs. And on the, so on this side <laughs> is the actual straw. And then on the other side are the oat buds or tops. They're the immature seeds. And as an herbalist, I make herbal medicines called tinctures, which are an alcohol extract where you extract the medicine um, by steeping or um, macerating um, the herb in alcohol. And then the alcohol extracts the medicine. And then you take that alcohol in little drops in water. It's not like you're drinking a lot of alcohol. You're just, it's just a carrier for the medicine. So the oat heads or the buds, um, the immature seed buds, we actually put in um, alcohol and that's a calming medicine if you are having an anxiety attack or you're nervous or <laughs> something like that, you can take it as a medicine. And like I said, we, I don't know how, we didn't weigh it, but I would say we probably harvested about 30 pounds of this in the past week. And it's something I, this is something I do utilize regularly in my life, so. Um, so like I said, the elements are, you wanna look for good airflow and ventilation in your space. Um, you wanna hang your herbs like I had the oats hanging, or you want to place them on a basket or a tray. You can see here on the top tray, I have calendula flowers drying. How many people are growing calendula, anybody? It's actually, isn't it? It's such a beautiful herb. It's a um, yellow flower that just, once you plant it, it just grows abundantly. Every day there's new blooms. We pick them every day and then there's new ones. And so we lay them out on baskets and we're drying them or wilting them. And so sometimes we dry them. You can make a tea with them. You also can make an infused oil for topical application for your skin. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later. Um, and you can um, also put them in alcohol as well for a tincture. They have all kinds of healing qualities. They're healing to um, scars, eczema, psoriasis, 
fungal infections. <laughs> um, they're, they're just really a great herb and so easy to grow. They're a self-sowing annual. So when you plant them, if you let some of them go to seed next year, you'll have more <laughs> if they like where they are. I actually had them one time um, sprout in my doormat because I had a bed of them by the door and I had a grass doormat. <laughs> they started sprouting in the doormat. That's how, you know, uh, you know, abundant and hardy they are. Um, so you can use baskets as I have here. I just go to thrift shops and I buy baskets that I can lay the herbs out on. Underneath the calendula are flowers from the linden tree, which is also makes a beautiful tea. Um, I planted a linden tree in my yard because I love them so much, <laughs> but they also are planted by municipalities all over the place, parks and, you know, along the street lines. And the, um, the flowers and the bracts actually that are on the flower, some people think the brack is a leaf, but it's actually called a brack, but you harvest the flowers and the bracts and dry those and they make a really nice, calming, relaxing, soothing tea. And the tea is um, not only relaxing, but it's also uh, what we call mucilaginous or slimy, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> mucilaginous is a fancy word for slimy. Um, and it can be really um, soothing to like a sore throat or something along those lines. So that's what's on underneath the calendula. <laughs> You want a dark place, you don't want a sunny place. Sometimes people will think, oh, I should dry my herbs out in the sun, but actually that washes your herbs out. It actually breaks down the cell walls and it washes them out. So you want a dry place, but you don't want a sunny window or a sunny place um, to, um, to dry them. Uh, so, cause that, like I said, it'll wash out your herbs. And um, storing dried herbs. So this is the other thing. So once you dry them, you want to be mindful there could be moisture in your herb. And so for my back stock of herbs, I actually, um, especially for the ones I'm drying for tea, I put them in paper bags and for my, you know, the large quantities. And then the stuff that I'm going to use on a regular basis, I'll put in smaller jars and I'll replenish them regularly. And I get those little silica packets and I put those in the jars <laughs> just in case there's any moisture. I've been to people's houses and I look in their jars and their herbs are like, and they're all wilty and they look like, and they're starting to mold because if there's any moisture there, you're gonna have a problem. So just be really mindful about that. And if you have those, if start collecting those little silica packages because they come in all everything. So <laughs> just store them. Um, let me see if this, okay, good. It's going to give me the next thing. So like I said, storing containers that will breathe if you can. So the paper bags for large quantities is your best, um, best bet. And uh, store in a dry, temperate place. You don't want it too cold, too hot. You don't want moisture. You don't want it in your wet basement. <laughs> you want them on a shelf somewhere where it's, you know, uh, nice and dry and warm enough. And I har so I harvest for drying annually. So every year at the end of the year, you know, come about May or June, I'll take my herbs off the shelf if I haven't used them and I'll take them out to the compost and just give them back to the earth or I'll take them out to my chickens and feed them to my chickens. So I always figure it's not a waste you know, that that, hap if, that happens sometimes, you collect it extra. <laughs> so, and I figure I still eat it if I eat the eggs, I still eat it when I put my compost on my garden later. So I don't really see it as a waste. There's always feeding going on and herbs have a lot of minerals in them and they're gonna mineralize your soil, they're gonna mineralize your chickens <laughs> or your, any other animal that might eat them. So it's not, it never seems wasted to me. And then another thing I do sometimes is I dry and roast roots, and this will be more in the fall. I'll harvest chicory roots, burdock roots, dandelion roots, some things that gardeners pull out because they don't like them <laughs> can actually be roasted into a really nice beverage. I mean, chicory, 
Um, it tastes like coffee, a lot like coffee, <laughs> if you've never had it. And um, there's a lot of these in our gardens, right? <laughs> so um, we just chop it up really, really small and you can put it, I use a convection oven, but you can put it in any oven on a really low temperature and just have um, the airflow um, run through it. That's what I like about the convection oven. But you heat it up until it's roasted and then you grind it and it doesn't have any caffeine in it, but it tastes good. And it's like a nice warm beverage um, that's really high in minerals. These herbs are um, a little bitter, so they're really good for your digestion. So there's good reason to roast them. <laughs> they don't taste quite as good if they're not roasted. I've had people make dandelion root tea. Has anybody ever tried dandelion root tea? It's not that great tasting. <laughs> but when you roast it, it actually concentrates the inulin, which is actually sweet, and it makes it a little more, it makes it a lot more palatable. It's slightly bitter, but it's, it's much more palatable. And it tastes, if you like coffee, it tastes like a very light coffee. Chicory, I always say, if you like a dark blend, drink chicory. If you like a lighter blend, drink um, burdock and or dandelion so um, and you don't have to hate those plants because you know a lot of people don't like those plants is chicory the one that's growing alongside the roadside? the blue flowers yes okay. yeah so yeah basically you would just pull it and chop up the root yep dig up the root wait wait a little while because you want it more in the fall when it's not flowering anymore so, but mark your spots because when it's flowering, it's most obvious. I keep saying that chicory is putting on a show on the side of the roads right now. It's everywhere. Um, and the flowers are edible too. So we actually, at my house, we make a lot of wild salads. You know, we put dandelion and chicory in our salads and I put those flowers in my, on the top as a garnish and they look really beautiful. So you can eat your chicory flowers <laughs> and it's such a beautiful color. So how would you use your dried herbs? Like I said, mostly for teas, infusions, decoctions, as a spice in your food, you can prepare your own spices, um, add uh, dried greens. So I'll take my salads and if I don't eat it all, I'll chop it up real small. You can't do this with lettuce because lettuce has too much water in it. I'm not a fan of lettuce. Lettuce isn't as nutrient dense as these other greens that are in your garden that are wild and real hearty. Anybody familiar with lamb's quarters? They're, they're a weed <laughs> that comes up that's actually quite delicious and nutritious. So I chop all of those weeds up, <laughs> which are really herbs, and chop them up real small. And if we don't eat the whole salad, then we dry the greens and I throw them in my soups and stews in the winter time. And it's really nice because then you get some local wild greens in the winter um, that you may not be able to get because because buying vegetables in the winter in the grocery store to me they're just not as nutrient dense you know they've probably been picked unripe you know so having some of this stuff on hand just helps to give me some nutrition in the winter time and some flavor and you can also powder herbs and use them either either as a thickener or as a, um, a flavoring does anybody grow lovage in your garden it's a really wonderful plant. It's in the Umbelliferaceae family. It's in the uh, carrot family and it's and celery. It tastes like celery, but it's an herb. It's like an old world European herb and it's very beautiful and it's delicious. We do put it in salads when it's fresh, but I also dry it and powder it. And then I throw um, it, a couple spoonfuls of it in my soups and stews. I make a lot of soups and stews in the winter in my crock pots. So I just like throw <laughs> you know, whatever I have in. So I like to dry lovage and then um, uh, put it in a jar by the stove with the other you know, spices and herbs and it's really delicious. So that's a section on drying herbs. And I think that that's one of the big things that a lot of people do do with herbs. Um, and you can dry anything. You can dry thyme, oregano. Um, I drink nettle infusions. I grow nettle as an herb. <laughs> Some people aren't fond of it, but it's very nutritious and delicious. So I drink it all throughout the year. Um, and uh, let's see. So pretty much any herb can be dried. I don't think there's many herbs that you couldn't dry. Um, but does anybody have any questions about drying herbs? Yeah. 
Can you, you talked about roasting in the oven. Mm -hmm. Can you also dry in the oven? You can on really low, low temperature. The thing is when you're drying herbs, you're not trying to cook them. And that's the difficulty. You'd be better off um, putting them in a dehydrator without a heat setting because it's the airflow that you want. And if you start heating them, you start breaking down the cell wall and you basically start cooking them. So when I'm roasting them, I am cooking them and I'm doing that on purpose. But when I'm drying herbs, generally I want them to stay intact and just dry. So I'm more of a fan of using a dehydrator without the heat setting um, for generally drying herbs. But I don't do that. I actually have a space that has a nice ceiling fan I sometimes will even turn another fan on to you know, make sure the herbs get really good airflow. The way I lay them out, I don't pile them on top of each other. You know, I lay it out in a single layer and I hang things. So like I use rubber bands and I put them around the top and then I'll splay things open so there's, they'll get good airflow. So those are the th things you wanna think about. I don't like the a heating method because you'll see, and, and I always say to people, experiment, right? And try for yourself, dry something in an oven, even on a low temperature, and then dry something either in a room or on a de in a dehydrator without the heat setting. And look at the difference in the herbs. You'll see a color change and a, and a real, they look a lot more vibrant if you do it the way that I'm suggesting. So does that make sense? Yeah. I was just, there's so many different ways to do parsley. What would you recommend? Parsley. With parsley, yeah. Well, you can dry it. I mean, obviously that's one thing. And I'm gonna um, go through a couple different ways to preserve things. And one of the things I'll point out with parsley is um, it, it actually blends nicely with other herbs for making pestos. Okay. And you can store those, you can freeze pestos. So that's, that's one way. But you could also, with, when drying, when I talked about um, chopping up the um, chives and the oregano and those things for a uh, spice mix, Parsley would be nice in there too. I like the flavor of parsley. I think it adds just a nice little flavor to things. So, you know, you can definitely dry it, no doubt. Okay. So the next section of this is to talk about what we call macerating, which just means steeping. <laughs> it's just a fancy word. And I, I'm using these fancy words because you might see them in books and you know, go, oh, what does that mean? It means steeping. And a menstruum is whatever liquid you're steeping in. So if I'm making teas and infusions, I'm utilizing water. In this case, I have this beautiful picture of this honey flowing because I utilize a lot of honey for putting up herbs. I love honey. <laughs> I actually have some bees and I really, really appreciate honey a lot. Um, so the, uh, again, just to reiterate the, the terms here. So the macerating is to soften or steep and menstruum means your solvent, whatever you're steeping in. And there's all kinds of menstruums. So we can utilize honey, we can utilize vinegar. With the teas of an infusion, we'd be utilizing water. I mentioned alcohol earlier and oil. And so actually I have this picture of lavender. This is actually a fun photo. I went on a trip with a, um, one of my colleagues and we went to a lavender farm and we harvested all this lavender and we put it in honey and alcohol and oil and we made all kinds of herbal infusions. And we also, you can see here, harvest some rose petals and we put rose petals in all of those things as well. So it's really delicious, the honey, and it's a good carrier for, um, your herb because it is going to you can put it in a little hot water and just make a tea or you can add it to other teas um, and it's just a great way to store the herb and and give flavor and I'll use the um, honey sometimes for baking or cooking and they'll add flavor to um, whatever you're making so one of the honeys that I make, I harvest rose hips. They're actually um, one of my favorite herbs. And these are some heirloom varieties, Rigosa rose hips. So they're nice and big. So you cut them in half, take the seed out, put them in the jar, pour honey on top of them. And the honey suspends all the vitamin C that's in there and carotenes and carotenoids and other nutrients. 
And then you can put it in your tea. I also utilize these like maraschino cherries. <laughs> just kind of do some fun stuff with them. And any rose hip can be utilized this way. And you can also put rose petals in honey too, and it's really delicious. And you can put rosemary in honey and thyme in honey. And actually thyme is, uh, has a compound in it called thymol, and that's an antispasmodic. And so your thyme honey is a cough remedy in addition to being a culinary delight. <laughs> so it's really interesting. A lot of times, like you can do a whole, um, you could do a whole herbal workshop on the culinary herbs, the herbs in your spice cabinet um, and their healing properties <laughs> because they have a lot of healing uh, capacity. So like I said, you can put any of your herbs. Does anybody grow bee balm? You do, you do, nice. Oh, a lot of people, okay. And of course it grows wild everywhere, right? And when I talk about bee balm, I'm usually, I like all the bee balms, they're all edible actually, so you can put them in salads and add them to things. We actually um, cut some up this morning um, when we were getting ready for lunch and um, I made egg salad and we put that in our egg salad, <laughs> some fresh bee balm to give it some flavor just because I had a bunch of it we had harvested. But bee balm also has thymol in it. That's a strong smell. You can actually smell it. That's the Minarda fistulosa that I'm talking about. It's our wild bee balm. And that also can be made into a cough remedy. So you can steep it in honey. You could also steep it in honey and vinegar together. We make um, this really interesting, um, uh, it's an old time syrup where you just take honey and vinegar and you chop up your herb, put it in a jar, put honey and vinegar on top of it. I just shake the jar and it tastes like a sweet and sour syrup. And so if you have a cough, you just take a spoonful of that or you can put it in a little water and just drink it up and it's delicious. So there's all kinds of ways. And you, it also tastes good so you can put it in your salad dressing. <laughs> so there's all, it's funny because herbs are very versatile and they can be utilized for food, like I said, for food, for medicine, for spices. Um, so just my list here, I put lavender, roses, rose hips, rosemary, thyme, bee balm, holy basil. Anybody growing holy basil? It's called Tulsi. You're growing it? Yeah, that's another nice one that you can put up in honey and just chop it up and pour your honey on top. Of course, drying it as well. It's such a delicious tea. It's very calming and it's a self-sewing annual. I actually went to Hawaii a couple years ago and holy basil there is a perennial. <laughs> and I was so jealous because <laughs> here it's, it's an annual, but we can keep planting it or let it, you know, let it go to seed and let it seed itself. Fennel is really nice. Um, and fennel is nice in honey. It's also nice in that dried spice mix if you want to get some fennel in there. Um, and I'm talking about fennel, the herbaceous fennel, because we also have a bulb fennel. And that, um, the herbaceous part of that doesn't taste as good as the actual herbaceous fennel. So um, that's the one I'm talking about. Mint. We, I mentioned mint earlier, and it looked like there were a lot of heads like, oh yeah, what do we do with mint? Mint is really nice in honey. And then you can also bake and cook with it. If you want a mint flavor in something, you can um, bake and cook with it. How many people are growing mint on purpose or by accident? <laughs> I actually took, um, I, I, it's funny because I haven't tended to grow a lot of mint in my life um, because it spreads so much. And so now I have these um, really nice gardening boxes that I got. And I'm like, I'm just going to put all the mint in the boxes. <laughs> It'll stay as contained, pretty contained. Um, so, yeah, so you can put any of these herbs in honey and it's really, really nice. Um, so... The point of the honey, it preserves everything, it stores it, it suspends um, the nutritional value and the flavor. Honey itself is healing, so maybe some of you have heard that e eating local honey can help um, prevent um, seasonal allergies. It can help with colds and flus. 
And so if you add the herbs that are also healing, <laughs> then you've got um, you know, a, double, um, a double remedy from an herbal standpoint. And of course, honey is nutritious. It's got um, vitamin B, vitamin C in it. Um, it's got protein in it. So hu the honey itself is going to give you some nutrition. And I utilize honey in baking myself a lot. I don't really like to utilize refined sugar. So you either utilize honey or syrup. And all the things I'm talking about with honey, you could also do with maple syrup. Um, I actually moved um, to the Midwest I think it's almost 17 or 18 years ago, you know, because you lose track. But when I moved here, I was so happy that maple syrup became one of my wild foods. You know? <laughs> and I just have four trees and I tap them. And um, so I, you can utilize your syrup as well for, um, for steeping herbs if, if you're more interested in syrup than honey. Um, so you're only going to add and fuel all of these healing qualities of the honey by adding the herbs as well. Do you add, um, when you infuse it in honey, are you using dried herbs? Or is it no fresh. Yeah, I like fresh. You could utilize dried herbs, but the um, aromatic aspect, you know, when you dry herbs, you do lose some of the aromatic aspects because it's volatile, you know, it, it dissipates. So if you put the fresh herb in, it retains that. So like lavender honey, anybody growing lavender? Yeah, lavender honey is so delicious. <laughs> it has such a nice lavender flavor. And when you use fresh, but I've seen people utilize dry and it's kind of like real dull. And so the, it really pops. And the only hard part about this, some of this stuff is when you're going to preserve the herbs, you have to harvest them at the height of their potency. You can't wait until the flowers have dissipated because then they're not as strong. <laughs> so um, that's one of the hard parts. People say, well, I want to enjoy the flowers. I'm like, well, then they won't be as potent. <laughs> so um, you want to harvest flowers when the bees are on them because the bees know when the flowers are vibrant and, and really healthy. So my preference is um, not to say you can't utilize dried, but you're, you're going to get way better flavor and more vitamin C because vitamin C is also volatile. So if you want to suspend the vitamin C, which is one of my interests um, because I, I don't enjoy taking vitamin supplement pills. So I prefer to get everything through my herbs and my food. So if you want to suspend the vitamin C and nature's full of vitamin C, vitamin C is an antioxidant that protects plants. So plants are constantly exuding vitamin C. So the fresher they are, when you put them up, the dried herbs aren't going to have so much vitamin C, but when you put it in honey or our next topic is going to be vinegar, you're going to suspend that vitamin C and then that's going to, you know, support your body because vitamin C is definitely an antioxidant. It's um, an immune booster. So just before I move on to vinegar, does anybody have any questions about other questions about honey? No? Well, and remember, actually, I think this is an interesting thing to think about, is that the bees are foragers. They forage. I mean, how many people garden because you like the bees to come, right? That's one of the reasons a lot of us garden, for, so the pollinators will be attracted <clears throat> to it. So, and bees love, and po other pollinators love herbs. And so with um, thinking about that, the honey also contains some elements of the herbs that the bees have been foraging. So when you get the honey, you're going to get that as well. Um, it's really funny because I went to my dermatologist recently and she I did a procedure um, for me and she said, don't put any botanicals on your skin after this procedure. And I looked at her and because she knows I'm an herbalist. So she's like, her feeling was I shouldn't put botanicals. Of course I, I did, but, but she said, put petroleum jelly on your skin. And I looked at her and I said, you do know that petroleum jelly is fossilized botanicals. <laughs> so, and she just looked at me like, oh, yeah, okay, good point. <laughs> so, so it's just really funny. Um, 
So then our next topic, like I said, is vinegar. And I generally, you could utilize any vinegar that you want, but I like to utilize raw apple cider vinegar because it's in and of itself is healthful. It's helpful for digestion. It helps you absorb more vitamins and minerals. So I steep my herbs in vinegar. So this picture here with the purple flower is bee balm vinegar. <laughs> so we harvested the flowers and uh, we just did this a couple days ago. I, when I was putting this together, like I said, I was trying to put up to date photos of what we're doing right now. And so we made these vinegars. Um, and so we um, cut up the bee balm, the flowers and the leaves, pour the apple cider vinegar on top, leave it sit for four to six weeks and then strain it. And then the vinegar has the flavor and the um, healing qualities of the plant. And interestingly enough, bee balm, not only is it antispasmodic, it also is antifungal. So oddly enough, I mean, this is going to sound kind of weird, but you can use this in your salad dressings for flavor. You can utilize it as a cough remedy. You can also utilize it to heal athlete's foot. So <laughs> plants are really funny that way. They cover a lot of bases. And so what I do is take the, tell people to take that vinegar, put it in a little water and make a foot wash. Or if you um, aren't going to soak your feet, some people are like, oh, I don't have time to soak my feet. You could also put it in a spray bottle and spray it on your feet <laughs> or wherever else if you have a fungal infection. Um, so it's really interesting with these vinegars because we can also make a culinary or um, shrub. If you've ever heard of a shrub, it's a vinegar and a honey or sw some sweetener and water drink. And so we can take our vinegar and our honey and, you know, we can do the herbal thing or just plain and put water and ice and it makes a very refreshing beverage. So it's kind of fun. Herbalists call that a switchel. It's like a medicine and culinary people call it a shrub and people often ask me what's the difference between a switch and a shrub and i always say who you're talking to so if you're talking to a chef it's a shrub if you're talking to an herbalist it's a switch so it's kind of funny um so you can put any herb again in vinegar i also like to put berries up in vinegar you know i made a little um, blackberry vinegar the other day um, you know the rose hips can go in vinegar service berries, um, gosh, any berry that you're harvesting, you can put in vinegar and it makes a really, again, you can do salad dressings or beverages, um, et cetera, with your vinegars and all your culinary, you know, your rosemary, your thyme, excuse me, your um, oregano, any of those can go into vinegar for a really nice flavorful um, vinegar that you, of course, can also utilize for um, your salad dressings. So how do you prepare the vinegar? You pack your jar and you can see I'm not just doing flavoring here. Uh, sometimes you'll see um, vinegars for sale and they'll have one sprig of an herb in there. I'm actually packing the jar because I'm trying to get the vitamins and minerals. Uh, vinegar is very good at extracting minerals from plants and so I'm trying to extract those things so I'm packing my jar and that's the thing when people say oh I have all these herbs what do I do what do I do with them I'm like well here it is because you pack your jar you don't just put a sprig in there for flavor you're actually really trying to get a good um, a good oomph. This is actually a dandelion flower vinegar <laughs> that I made in the spring. Um, and, you know, I make violet vinegars. The violet turns purple. It's really kind of fun. And I actually made, I didn't put it in the slideshow, but um, I made a, well, maybe I did. I made a spiderwort tincture. Anybody growing spiderwort? That purple flower. And did you ever like squeeze it and you get that purple like um, liquid out of it and so when you make a tincture it turns purple <laughs> and so I did that one of my students said what why are you doing that are you going to use it as a tincture I said no I'm doing it because I'm going to make a beverage out of it for the color <laughs> it'll be really impressive if you serve some what people are calling these days mocktails are very popular where you know you utilize all these herbs preparations to make a imitation you know drink with no alcohol and I said that's what I'm gonna make our mocktails 
Um, okay. Oh, I do have it. It'll be my next slide. So, um, so again, one of your um, menstruums could be water. So you're going to make a tea and an infusion. Now, teas and infusions are made with dried plant material because you can't. Water doesn't get behind the cell wall fast enough before it would spoil. Vinegar and honey, the plant can sit in there for four to six weeks, and you strain it. But with water, it four to eight hours, and then it's going to start to spoil if you don't drink it up within the next day because, you know, it's just water. There's nothing to preserve it unless you take that infusion and turn it into something else. But generally speaking, we're making infusions, teas, decoctions, and drinking them really quickly or making foot baths out of them. Sometimes even like with my rose hip um, infusions, I, sometimes I make jelly out of it. I use that as a base for a jelly. So there's all kinds of creative things you can do. You could make a mint infusion and make a mint jelly with it. Uh, so there's, uh, you could use your mint uh, honey to add to sweeten your mint jelly. <laughs> so you can see this can be, I consider this an art form. When you're cooking with herbs, when you're preserving them, once you start doing it, there's just all kinds of creative things you can do. Um, and with dried herbs, um, Oh, I forgot I didn't finish my sentence. <laughs> Typically using dry herbs for these. Oh, that is the sentence, okay. Um, so you are utilizing dried herbs. I, here I have rose hips, I have linden, I make oat straw, I make nettle infusions and in teas. You can utilize roots. A decoction is more when you um, boil the herb and that's for hard parts like um, roots and seeds and that kind of thing. Um, and you can see, I make large quantities of this. Anybody who comes to my house gets served infusions. Um, when, when COVID hit, I started serving everybody elderberry infusion who came to my house, like here. <laughs> or because this is, you know, it's, it's an antiviral. So, you know, it can't, all I would say to people is it can't hurt. <laughs> So I can't guarantee anything, but it can't hurt. And elderberries will be um, harvestable soon. And I both wild harvest them and I do grow some named varieties of elderberry as well. And we just finished up harvesting the flowers. The flowers can be dried for tea. Um, they can also be stored in all these other menstruums that I'm talking about. And elderflowers are really good at reducing a fever. They're antiviral like the berries, but what they do different than the berries is that they help um, to reduce a fever. And they're very delicious, <laughs> so. Okay, any questions about water preparations? You're getting the crash course in herbal medicine making. <laughs> um, so an alcohol, so this is my spider wart alcohol extract. Isn't that amazing, that color? <laughs> It's just like, what, that looks, it looks fake, right? <laughs> you know, one thing I was um, looking up and I want to do this is a little off topic, but it's interesting, is that these um, herbs that have pigments like this, you can make paint out of them. And so I was looking at the process of turning it into a paint <laughs> because I thought that would, I mean, this color would be so amazing as a paint. So a tincture or an alcohol extract, like I said, it's pre predominantly how a lot of herbalists will um, suspend the medicine from plants. Um, it, water is one way that we work with plants, but alcohol is really easy. And so you just take your plant material, chop it up, pour alcohol on top. I use um, organic vodka for my tinctures. Um, some people use a higher octane um, alcohol. I don't like the taste of those, so I don't use them. Um, some people do use brandy. I know one woman who utilizes scotch. And it's not like you're drinking this stuff. You're just taking it, like usually you store it in a dropper bottle and you just take it by the drops. So you're not, um, it's not like you're drinking a lot of um, alcohol when you're ingesting it. So, um, so again, you're filling your jar completely. And this herb here is actually one we just made these tinctures actually. Um, and this is Hypericum perforatum or St. John's wort. And this plant has been shown to help be um, mood elevating. It's antispasmodic. It's also antiviral. So um, that's a good thing to know about it. It's healing to the nervous system. 
And so we can dry it and make a tea, that's one option, but we can also put it in alcohol and take it as a tincture. We can also store it in oil, which I'm gonna talk about next. Um, so I like tinctures mostly for like emergencies or if you're really not feeling well and you're, you're, you don't want to make a tea <laughs> because it just seems like it's going to be um, too much trouble. Like, you know, when you really don't feel well, you, even making tea can be challenging. I actually have um, uh, at times, um, especially since COVID, taken teas and infusions to friends' doors and just leaving them there because I know they won't make it for themselves. So just to help with healing. So um, I don't know how many people are familiar with this herb, but if you look at the bottom uh, slide, I was harvesting this and my f fingers are purple because this um, plant, when you squeeze the buds, has a purple oil in it. Even though the flowers are yellow, there's a purple oil and it's, it's almost like magic. <laughs> you, you, you're like, wow, look at that. And so you can see my preparation on the top slide is starting to turn red. So that's what happens to the alcohol or if you put it in oil, it'll start to turn. And you want it to be red, that tells you that you've extracted the medicine. So I, is alcohol like one of the best ways of indefinitely storing something? It's great because it extracts medicines, first of all, alkaloids and compounds in plants that are more medicinal, and it, they don't really go bad, yeah. Yeah, they pretty much store indefinitely. I mean, I try to harvest annually so I have fresh plant material, but if you, like for example, I make echinacea tincture, and echinacea, how many people are growing echinacea? such a beautiful plant, but it's also a great medicine. <laughs> and a lot of people, I'll go on a tangent, then I'll get back to your question, um, harvest the root of echinacea. But actually that cone, in the because it's called purple cone flower, it has a cone in the middle, that cone has the medicine. So if you don't want to dig up your plants, you can take that cone and put that in alcohol and it, you know, it will preserve it. Um, so even though I prefer to harvest annually and try to keep it fresh, I have had some plants like echinacea around for, cause I make a lot of echinacea tincture. Echinacea boosts your own um, innate immune response. And so if you have an infection or you're not feeling well, it's a great one to take a lot of. So I try to keep a lot of that on hand. So I have overproduced it <laughs> at times and then had it for a good number of years and it doesn't seem to lose its potency. And yeah, and alcohol never goes bad, so <laughs> yeah. So was it dried herbs that you said you compost after a year? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. With the tinctures. Now the tinctures, I do strain them in four to six weeks. So I do strain them. And then that plant material either goes in my compost or to my chickens. So, and th then they're getting all the healing qualities. You know, people like worm their chickens, for example, or worm their animals or, you know, dust them for mites or do all these things. And I find if I'm feeding my animals herbs, I don't have to do those things because they're getting all these healing qualities. Their immune systems are being boosted. So it's kind of like a double benefit. <laughs> we could do a whole program on that. Um, anything else about alcohol before I move on to oil? So oil, and I utilize oil both for food and medicine. I generally utilize olive oil. Um, for example, for eating, I make rosemary oil and I pack the jar with rosemary, pour the oil on top, leave it sit for again four to six weeks using fresh plant material, strain it off. And then I love cooking with rosemary oil. I bake bread and I utilize that in my bread and you know, cause bread calls for olive oils <laughs> or some kind of fat. Um, and then I saute onions when I'm making a stir fry and it just adds that nice flavor to your meal. You could put any of your herbs up in oil and have that benefit. And that's sometimes an easier way than adding you know, <laughs> dried herb or an additional way cause you can do both. And so I use them for, t for cooking, but I also utilize them for topical application as an herbalist. So I make infused oils for healing pain, um, for like the um, St. John's wort oil is antispasmodic, it's healing to the nervous system. So I um, made a pain relief lotion that has St. John's wort, rosemary, and um, 
arnica in it. And I had sciatica a couple years ago, which was very painful. Anybody ever have sciatica? Horribly painful. And this herbal lotion that I made with those three oils would relieve the pain for hours. It was the only herbal thing that would work. And so I found topical application of herbs um, in lotions or just in plain oil form or a salve can be really helpful in healing. So I make a lot of oils and make salves and lotions. This is a picture of one of my salves that I make. This is a salve with calendula and chickweed in it. And this is helpful for healing uh, eczema and psoriasis. So you can see those oils and rosemary makes a nice oil um, that you can use in a salve. The salves can be used as a lip balm, you know, for dried lips. And it's just beeswax and oil. <laughs> so it's very easy to make. I actually knew a woman who just made an olive oil salve, no herb involved. <laughs> it's just beeswax and olive oil because olive oil is good for your skin. And then you add the herbs and then you get that extra benefit from the herbs. And then I talked about earlier pestos. I make a lot of pestos. So I put lots of different herbs in. Um, you know, I do utilize basil, but sometimes I'm putting odd things in there too. Like I make a dandelion leaf pesto and a nettle pesto and uh, leek pesto with, um, you know, wild leeks. You could also use cultivated leeks. And I, when I say pesto, what I'm really making is a paste, and I'm combining the herb with the olive oil and blending it in my blender. And then I take these little four ounce jars and I freeze them. And then if I want to use it as a pesto, later I can put cheese and nuts in it. Or I can just use the pestos as a flavoring in my salad dressings or in my soups or in a sauce. And these are really nice. I've done watercress. Um, I've added other herbs. You can add oregano, um, thyme, anything you want. Add a little bee balm to give it some more flavor. You can make kale pesto. Um, I saw people making tomato leaf pesto. <laughs> I thought that was, I wasn't sure I was so excited about that, but <laughs> people were doing it. <laughs> so. I make a pesto with a dried tomato. Okay, with tomatoes, okay. yeah, yeah. But they were using the leaves. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but I've put, yeah, I've put tomato in my pesto too. It's really good. Yeah, it's, I love tomatoes. Purple tomatoes? Yeah, purple pesto. Oh, purple pesto. Well, does that have the basil in it? No, well, it's the basil, the purple basil. Purple basil, sure, yeah, 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 nice. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be green, it could be purple. <laughs> and you know, color is really nice. Our, our food is more engaging if it has good color. So these four ounce jars are great for freezing this stuff so you can you know, have it available. I yeah. also use the uh, IQ trays. Yes, some and people that, do that, yep. That's, that's nice to do too. Yeah. You know how much it's yeah. got. Yep. Yeah, so you can put it in ice cube trays and then put it in a baggie and put it in the freezer, so instead of the four ounce jars. I find the reason I like the four ounce jars is that you don't get as much freezer burn or freezer oh, flavor okay. with the jars. So that's why I prefer them, but okay. you know. Good idea. Uh, let's see. So, um, so here I said it could be frozen in ice cream trays there. Um, and here's some herbs you could use for pesto. Basil, uh, arugula, I don't know if anybody grows arugula, but it's nice and spicy and easy to grow. Um, garlic scapes, if anybody has garlic scapes, they make nice pesto. Parsley, I have your parsley in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, garlic mustard, which is a weed that a lot of people get upset with, but you can add it to your pestos. And really any other green that you like, you can, you can play with. Okay, anything about pestos? Any other? I have a couple questions from YouTube here. Yes, go ahead. Um, going back to infusions, which I mm -hmm. believe was water? Yes. Okay. Um, so we have a question from Nikki. How long will an infusion stay? How many days? So generally, I say drink it up within 24 to 48 hours. And if you're not going to drink it up within like eight hours, put it in the fridge. Um, they're high in protein, so the pro it starts. They do start to spoil, and then if they start to spoil, they usually you'll know because they don't taste good anymore and they smell weird. So then I just water something, my plants with it. So don't ever go to waste because it has a lot of minerals in it. So, yeah, but I do try to drink it up pretty quickly. I drink about a quart of infusion a day myself. Today I drank oat straw. 
you know, tomorrow I might have nettle, the next day I might have oat straw. I just do it spontaneously based on, unless I have a specific reason for wanting to drink it. But yeah, you may, I make them every night and then I drink it the next day. That's typically what I do. Yeah. And then another question from Betsy, how long do herbs steep in oil before it's ready to use? Four to six weeks and then you strain it and then you can keep it, you want to store it in a dark cabinet or cupboard and then you can start using it or until you can't wait any longer that's <laughs> I always say that if you're really anxious but generally um you're it takes about four to six weeks uh, if it's a fresh plant to fully break down the cell wall so yeah great is that it okay so oh go ahead all summer long or is there um you want to stop when they start flowering and usually by then they start to get bitten up too. Do you notice they get eaten up? So usually, you know, I harvest, and that for me, that was like two weeks ago when they started to um, flower. And they have real small, tiny, inconspicuous flowers on them. They look, they don't even look like flowers <laughs> unless you look under a lens. Um, so, but that's when we typically stop harvesting, yeah. So pickling is another thing. I'm big in pi into pickling and fermenting. And when you ferment and pickle things, it helps your digestion. So you have your beneficial bacteria. So here I have uh, fermented burdock pickles. And um, so I harvest the root and I put it with apple cider vinegar and shuyu. And this recipe, by the way, is on my website. If anybody wants the actual recipe, um, my website is moonwiseherbs.com. And I have a blog with recipes and you can go there and get the recipe for the burdock pickles. They're really delicious. And then um, next to those, um, I um, have grape leaves pickled. And we pickle those grape leaves, and we just did this a couple weeks ago. And then any time of the year, you can take them out and roll some rice into them, or that we make what's called a dolma, ground meat and rice with herbs inside, and roll it up, and you can eat them. And they're pickled, like I said, they're pickled and fermented, so they're good for your digestion, and you get more vitamins and minerals that way. And purslane, which is a weed that a lot of people pull out, that can be pickled as well. And then, um, and I'm just rushing a little bit through this because I realize we um, are running low on time. <laughs> There's so much to talk about. Um, I make kraut and I add herbs to my kraut, either my cabbage or carrot kraut. So you can add, you know, all any, you can see on the one lower, um, uh, where I have the cutting boards, the lower slide, there's a whole bunch of minced herbs and we just throw them in there, chives and oregano and thyme, and just throw it in with the kraut. And um, again, I do have a, a YouTube video on how to make carrot kraut on my website. So if you go to my website, you can actually get the instructions on how to make this. Um, since um, that's not what we really have time for here. Another thing you can make are condiments. So uh, gamachio is toasted sesame seeds and you put a bunch of herbs in with the toasted sesame seeds and then herbal salts. And these are dried herbs that you would add to these things and you can um, put, them, put it in with salt and then have that available when you're cooking as well. So there's just so many ways to store and put up herbs and have them available all throughout the year, especially, you know, when I moved to Wisconsin, I lived in Seattle, Washington and that area for years. And I could grow herbs, like at least something all year long. And then I moved here in the winter. I'm like, uh, I want my herbs. And so I really got um, kicked up my game of making this stuff so that I have it all year long and I can have um, the flavors and the nutrition and the benefit of my herbs from my herb garden all throughout the year. And here's a resource list for you all. Um, so you can take a snapshot of that or you can relook at the video and I'll, I'll leave it up for a couple minutes. But any last questions? We've got a minute or two to, to see if there's anything anybody would like me to address. Where do you find roses? So I grow roses and um, sometimes you'll find them out in the wild. Like we have the multiflora rose as an invasive rose in this area. It has a very tiny hip on it, but you can put those little hips in your honey and stuff too. And you know, those, I, when I go hiking on DNR land, there's tons of those and they will not be upset if you harvest some because they're very invasive.
varieties. <laughs> so, yeah. But I also grow, like I grow the heirloom varieties, yeah. Yeah, anybody else? All right, well, thanks for being here, everybody. And um, check out my website if you want any of the recipe, exact recipes. And hopefully you'll enjoy the series. If you didn't get to see the whole series, you can always go back and rewatch it. So thanks, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>